We're back looking at this man in the land of Uz. Job. Job chapter 3. And this is going to be Job's request for a rendezvous with death. Job 3.1. After this, open Job his mouth and cursed his day. You see, Job had been quiet for seven days and seven nights, laying there in those ashes amongst his friends in shame and agony. This worn out, worn in, beaten down saint of the Lord opened his mouth. And I'm sure his lips were parched. I'm sure his throat was sore. I'm sure his breath had the smell of death. And Job is a perfect and upright man. But every man is a sinner without exception, and their throat is an open sepulcher. And he has a request for death. He wants a rendezvous with death. Job is an upright man who would never kill himself. So how could he die? Laying there with his thoughts for those seven days and seven nights, he had some time to think about death. After this, Job opened his mouth and cursed his day. And Job spake and said, Let the day perish wherein I was born, and the night in which it was said, There is a man-child conceived. If you could go back to the night that you were conceived and stop your parents from meeting, would you do it? I'm sure a lot of you have been in that shape. I know many people say, Well, you never had it like Job had it. That may be true, but is Job the only person that experiences pain? Uh, many times you get the idea that if you're not having it as bad as Job had it, then that means you can't say anything. And it may be true, we may never have it like Job had it. But when you're going through it, when you're going through whatever you're going through, you probably feel like you are having it like Job had it. And you might have wished that you could hop in a DeLorean and go back to 1985 or 1955 or 2015 or whenever it was you were born and stop your parents from laying with each other that night and maybe stop them from meeting altogether. I bet that thought's crossed a lot of people's mind. It is a foolish thought. It's a thought that can never be fulfilled. It, it's a crazy, self-loathing, self-absorbed fantasy. And when you're going through literal hell on earth, you start thinking crazy thoughts like that. Job is a perfect and upright man. And I would never judge him for acting out of character under these circumstances. Because you can go through something that causes you to do things that are out of character. So Job is down and out in depression. And he, he's got some wishes here, some requests He's got some things that he wishes the Lord would do for him. And it says in verse 3, Let the day perish when I was born. What a request. Kind of reminds you of, a, of Elijah and other people in the Bible. Jonah. You know, Elijah, he sat up under a juniper tree and requested that he might die. Even Paul in a much better way, Paul said, you know, I'm in, a, I'm in a straight betwixt two, having a desire to depart to be with Christ, which is far better. He had a desire to depart. You know, there's nothing wrong with wanting to die, but what are the reasons that you want to die? It says, let the day perish when I was born, and the night in which it was said there is a man-child conceived. Let that day be darkness. Let not God regard it from above, neither let the light shine upon it. So I'm going to go through this and just talk about what Job's going through. And then at the end, we're going to come back and look at it again. Maybe get a little bit more detailed and things. But he's basically saying, let not God regard it from above. You see, God holds time in his hand. And if God wanted to, he could press rewind on your life like it was a DVD and put your birth in the deleted scenes of the movie, and it, he could if he wanted to. He's the director, he's the producer, he's the author of time, he's the alpha, the omega, the beginning, and the ending. He could do that. He could press rewind, go back there the night you were born, when your parents met, got with each other, make it never happen. But God doesn't work this way. He's, going, he's not going to go back and change the choices that people made. 
And Job is begging for God to put his birth in the recycle bin. You know, m maybe grab death, send him back in time so that he could reap him the day he was born. Job 3, 5, let darkness and the shadow of death stain it. Let a cloud dwell upon it. Let the blackness of the day terrify it. Maybe even make it as if it never happened. As for that night, let darkness seize upon it. Let it not be joined into the days of the year. Let it not come into the number of the months. Still talking about the day of his birth. He's thinking, you can go back, Lord, change it. Then nobody will know whatever happened, and we can just all forget about all this. And a lot of times you might think to yourself, you know, if I was never born, I wouldn't have to worry about my loved ones missing me because they would never know I existed. That's a crazy thought. You start thinking to yourself, well, if I died, everybody would miss me, but maybe if God could just make it where I was never born, then, you know, it would be like in none of it ever happened. That's those foolish thoughts that can't be fulfilled. And Job is thinking, you know, that day I was born doesn't have to be a day that joined to the days of the year. You know, it doesn't have to be that. It doesn't have to come into the number of the months. It could be like it just never happened on your timeline. It doesn't have to be a day that comes into the number of the months. I mean, God, you had the power to take the day. You have the power to take the day away. Because, I mean, you lengthen and shorten days in the Bible. So Job is thinking, God, maybe you can just shorten that day and just shrink it so much until it just doesn't even exist. He says in verse 7, Lo, let that not be solitary. Let no joyful voice come therein. So Job is thinking, I know it was a joy when I was born, but nobody saw the end of my story. You see, Job thinks he's at the end of his road. He's at the end of the story here, and it's not ending well for him. And it talks about in John 16, 21, that it's a joy when a man is born into the world. So Job must be thinking that his mother and father probably had joy, had, probably had a joyful voice the night he was born. But they didn't know what he was going to be going through in the end. And he probably thinks if they knew that he was going to go through this, they probably wouldn't have even had him be born. That's the way he's thinking. He says in verse 8, Let them curse it that curse the day, who are ready to raise up their morning. Let the stars of the twilight thereof be dark. Let it look for light but have none. Neither let it see the dawning of the day. Because it shut not up the doors of my mother's womb, nor hid sorrow from mine eyes. You see, Job hates this day, the day of his birth. Because on this day, the Lord opened the doors of his mother's womb. And see, the Lord is the one who's in charge of opening and closing the womb. So even though Job is not cursing God and dying, in a sense, he's still blaming God because God is the one that allowed him to be born. But Job, he's like, why did, why did you have to open the doors of my mother's womb so that I could be born and have all this sorrow come before mine eyes? Why did I have to go through this life of sorrow? This life of sorrow is why Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 7.1, A good name is better than precious ointment in the day of death than the day of one's birth. Job wishes God would just take a giant vacuum and suck that day right back up the day he was born suck up the stars of that day don't let the sun show up that day i mean the lord can cause the sun to stand still in the bible right so he could get rid of the sun from ever coming up on that day but god doesn't work that way what's done is done and job says why couldn't i have just died then before i was even born if i can't die when i'm born why not just die before i was born and I'm sure you've been miserable enough to think that before. But once again, those are just foolish thoughts that can never happen. You know, once you've been born, you're born. There's nothing you can do about it. It's like when you get born again. You're saved. You're born again. You can't get unborn. In Job 3, 11 through 13, Why died I not from the womb? Why did I not give up the ghost when I came out of the belly? You know, why did I not just go ahead and die and have my soul be in departing? Why did the knees prevent me? 
or the breasts that I should suck? You know, why did the knees prevent me? Prevent as in go before. For now should I have lain still and been quiet. I should have slept. Then had I been at rest, lain still like a stillbirth. Uh, Job wished that he had a rendezvous with death at his birth. He said, for now should I have lain still. You know, they say that the Bible is just old and out of date. But it said still, like stillbirth. People still say that. And that's what Job's wishing for. That when he just came out, he would have just laid there and, and just been quiet and dead. And then he would not have to go through all this misery and sorrow. But something else is, he wouldn't have got to experience all that joy either. All the joy that he had when all his children were born. And the day that he met his wife, who he loved, I'm sure, even though they weren't have, having a good relationship right now. He wouldn't have been able to have all this joy. He wouldn't have been able to counsel all those people that he counseled and help all the people that he helped. You see, but when you're in this situation, you're not taking all those things into consideration. You really don't want to not be born or to die. Think about all those things, those joyful times, and the people around you that you do have. Now, I'm not saying that everybody has that. There are exceptions where people don't have anybody. And they've not had any joyful times. I understand that. But for the most part, if you're listening to this, you've probably got kids or people that you love. And if you were never born or you died, you would miss that person. But if he had lain, he thinks, you know, if I had lain still, had a stillbirth, you know, right now I could be at rest instead of in a pile of ashes. In verse 14, he could be at rest, you know, with kings and counselors of the earth, which built desolate places for themselves. You see, the kings and counselors and great men of the earth are all going to die too, without exception. You may look at a king or a president or something like that, and you think, wow, this person has just got it figured out. But that day is going to come. I mean, they're going to get old. And everybody has to die. It's appointed unto men once to die. But after this, the judgment, Hebrews 9, 27. Uh, death is no respecter of persons. It takes kings, it takes counselors, it takes princes, it takes children, it takes older people, it takes middle-aged people, it takes teenagers, it takes princes, as it says in verse 15, or with princes that had gold, who filled their houses with silver, or as in hidden untimely birth, I had not been as infants which never saw light. So Job wishes he died before he even came out of the womb or saw light. And take into consideration here how Job calls an unborn baby an infant, showing that he believes, you know, it's a person. It's a live person inside of the woman. You see, for Job, death is a welcome friend because in death, he says in verse 17, there the wicked cease from troubling. And there the weary be at rest. Job has that wicked one troubling him. And he thinks, you know, if I can die, he can't bother me no more. And he knows there's no rest for the wicked. And right now, Job is having no rest. Job is facing the torment that a wicked man is going to face in hell, where there's no rest. He's ready for rest, and the only way that he thinks that's going to come is through death. So that goes to show you that Job has assurance of salvation. Now, he doesn't have salvation like me and you have it. But he knows that when he dies, he's not going to go to hell. And John, uh, Job 3.18, There the prisoners rest together. They hear not the voice of the oppressor. Acts 10.38 talks about the oppressed of the devil. That's who's oppressing Job. He's sick of hearing that voice say, curse God and die. It says in verse 19, the small and greater there, and the servant is free from his master. You see, death doesn't have favorites. It doesn't matter if you're an unborn baby, a hundred years old, a king, a counselor, a prince, small or great. Death is going to find you. Wherefore is light given to him that is in misery, and life unto the bitter in soul. 
Job asks a great question of life here. Why does God allow people to be born who he knows will be in misery? That's basically the question. Why is life given to those who are bitter in soul? Why not let only the happy people be born? Why let the miserable be born? Verse 21, which says, Which long for death, but it cometh not, and dig for it more than for hid treasures. You see, there are people who have tried to commit suicide and it didn't work. Or maybe they search and dig for the easiest way to commit suicide that causes the least amount of pain. You see, to them, death is an open treasure chest. In Job 3.22, it says, which, which rejoice exceedingly and are glad when they can find the grave. You see, there are people right now who are going through so much pain that they would dig the grave and bury themselves if they could. So he says, why is light given to a man whose way is hid and whom God hath hedged in? You know, God, why do you allow people to be born that's like me that's going to end up like this? Hedged in to the point that he can't get out. Job is in a situation that he feels like he can't get out of. And we've all been through something like that probably. Even though it's not as bad as Job, it's still bad. And there are people with diseases and handicaps that feel like there is no way out of the mess that they're in. They feel as if they are trapped in their own body. So why is light, life, given to that person when God knows that it's going to happen? And Job 3.24, For my sighing, sighing cometh before I eat, and my roarings are poured out like the waters. You see, a man can be in so much physical pain that his screams begin to sound like a roaring Animalistic sounds can come from people in the tormented Job. So why is Job, why was he allowed to be born? Well, think about it. If God didn't allow you to be born, sure, you wouldn't have had to go through all these horrible things. But if he didn't allow you to be born, you wouldn't have been able to go through all these good things. You wouldn't have ever had the opportunity to be in fellowship with God. You wouldn't have had the opportunity to get saved and spend eternity with God. You know, so you say, it's not fair that I was born because i got to go through all this. Look at it the other way. It wouldn't be fair if he didn't let you be born and allow you to have an opportunity to spend eternity in complete pleasure and joy. You see, you got to look at it both ways. And I guarantee you, for the most part, maybe not for everybody, but for the most part, the good times outweigh the bad times. And even when you were lost, God makes the sun to rise on the evil and on the good. And the reason that bad stuff happens is because God allows people to make choices. God allows you to make choices. And sometimes you make the wrong choices and they bring bad things. Sometimes the people around you make bad choices and it brings bad things on the people around them. One of those people being you. So that you got to take that into consideration. You got to take into consideration that sin came into the world. The biggest reason that bad things are going on is because sin came into the world, and we're all groaning and travailing in pain because of that sin. The creation itself is. But you have to know that it's all going to be over one day. This all this is only temporary. It says in verse twenty-five, for the thing which I greatly feared has come upon me, and that which I was afraid of is come unto me. This shows that Job already feared God. He already knew God could allow something like this to happen. The thing from his worst nightmare has arrived at his doorstep. He says, I was not in safety, neither had I rest, neither was I quiet, yet trouble came. You see, Job wasn't living it up in all his wealth and prosperity. He wasn't going around saying, nobody can touch him or, or nobody can bring him down. He wasn't saying that. He was living for God and even offering burnt offerings for his children and back there in chapter 1 just in case they had sinned in their heart. So, you know, Job says, I was not in safety. He wasn't walking around with a false sense of security. He knew this could happen to him. He says, neither had I rest. He was laboring for the Lord. Neither was I quiet. He was opening his mouth for the Lord. Yet trouble came anyway. And for those who are quick to judge Job, you have to remember what Job is going through. His torments are so bad that it actually makes him not only a type of a person who's going through literal hell in the heart of the earth, but also a type of the tribulation saint. So let's hit rewind and go back to verse 1, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. 
In Job 3, 1, it says, After this, jo uh, opened Job his mouth and cursed his day. Now, this is the difference between Job and the wicked in the tribulation. Because Job opens his mouth and curses his day. But in Revelation 13, 6, the Antichrist opens his mouth in blasphemy against God. Job doesn't do that. In Revelation 16, 9, 16, 11, and 16, 21, the wicked in the tribulation blaspheme God because of the pain that is coming on them. Job doesn't. He doesn't curse God directly, but he does curse his day. You see, the day of his birth and and the day of his birth is not cursing the day of your birth is not cursing God, but who's the one responsible for the day of your birth? God is. And at this time Job's acting out of character. So maybe he is not taking into consideration that, you know, hey, I'm here I was birthed because of God. But it says, And Job spake and said, Let the day perish when I was born, in the night in which it was said, There is a man-child conceived. Notice that phrase, man-child. You see, a tribu that's a tribulation key word. Now, you need to write these key words down, highlight them, underline them. But this will really help you when you're reading the Old Testament, these key words like this. You find the word man-child in Revelation 12, 4 through 5. That's in the tribulation context. You see, the devil wants to devour that man-child as soon as it was born. And but what and what is Job doing in this chapter? Wishing death would have got him as soon as he was born. It says in verse 4, Let that day be darkness. Let not God regard it from above. Neither let the light shine upon it. Now notice that phrase, that day. When you see the phrase, in that day or that day, uh, it's, it's going to be a tribulation context. Uh... So that's more key words for the tribulation and second coming. You see, in that, that day of the Lord or in that day, it's primarily usually referring to the second coming and also the tribulation many times and the millennium. And then also you see darkness. Look at that phrase, let that day be darkness. Big key word for the tribulation and second coming. Joel 2.2 2 says, a day of darkness and of gloominess. A day of clouds and of thick darkness as the morning spread up on the mountains. And it goes on to, in Job 2, talking about us coming back with the Lord at the second coming. Also consider how in the tribulation, in Revelation 16.10, the Antichrist kingdom becomes full of darkness. So Job says in 3.5, Let darkness and the shadow of death stain it. Let a cloud dwell upon it. Let the blackness of the day terrify it notice that the shadow of death that's associated with the tribulation time period i've heard many pastors teach how it could even be an actual physical physical thing in the tribulation that passes over you in the sky that word cloud another key word because when the lord comes back at the second coming in vengeance what happens behold he cometh with clouds in revelation 1 job 3 6 as for that night let darkness seize upon it let it not be joined unto the days of the year. Once again, that night is associated with the tribulation. It's likened to nighttime. Remember how Paul talks about in 1 Thessalonians, we're not children of the night, we're children of the day, me and you. But Job's talking about that night and says, let it not be joined unto the days of the year. Think about that. Let it not be joined unto the days of the year. If you think about it, the tribulation, which is Daniel's 70th week, it isn't joined to the time period before it, and it's not joined to the time period after it. It isn't joined to the church age, and it isn't joined to the millennium. It's like a parenthesis in there. Job 3, 7, Lo, let that night be solitary. Let no joyful voice come therein. If you go through the tribulation, then you missed the joyful voice. Uh, that happened right before it, and it said, Come up hither. That was the rapture. Job 3, 8, Let them curse it that curse the day who are ready to raise up their mourning. The people in the tribulation raise up their mourning, in, in a sense, because the Antichrist will be the people's choice. That's who they raise up. And the one they raise up is going to cause them to mourn. Not only that, but in Revelation 13, the Antichrist raises up from the dead, and then he really gets mean. He really brings mourning to the people's lives. 
Job 3, 9, Let the stars of the twilight thereof be dark. Let it look for light, but have none. Neither let it see the dawning of the day. Once again, that darkness, just like the tribulation. Revelation 8, 12 talks about how when that fourth angel sounds, a third part of the stars, and you know, a third part of the moon and the sun are smitten, and a third part of them is dark, and the day, and the day shall not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. It's darkness, a time of darkness in tribulation. And that's what Job's going through. He says in um, Job 3, 10 through 13, Because it shut not up the doors of my mother's womb, nor hid sorrow from mine eyes. Why died I not from the womb? Why did I not give up the ghost when I came out of the belly? Why did the knees prevent me? Or why, did the, why the breast that I should suck? For now should I have lain still and been quiet. I should have slept. Then had I been at rest. Those people who take the mark of the beast in the tribulation are said to have no rest day nor night in Revelation 14, 11. And they will be in hell wishing they had lain still at birth and been quiet. They would, they're would they going to wish that the knees did prevent them. That way they would never have ended up in that place of torment. People in hell will wish they had never been born when they're down there with kings and counselors and princes and and everything else. There he says in verse 17, Job 3, 17, There the wicked cease from troubling, and there the weary be at rest. It is that wicked. You see, the wicked cease from troubling. When it's all said and done, the wicked are going to cease from troubling. It is the wicked one who causes trouble in the tribulation. Second Thessalonians 2, 8 calls him that wicked uh, Jeremiah 30 and verse 7 calls it the time of Jacob's trouble. But when Jesus Christ comes back at the second coming, there the wicked cease from troubling, and the weary will be at rest in the millennium. It says in verse 18, There the prisoners rest together. They hear not the voice of the oppressor. Once again, the devil's the oppressor, Acts 10, 38. And look at Job three nineteen through 22, the small and greater there. The servant is free from his master. Wherefore is light given to him that is in misery, and life unto the bitter in soul, which long for death, but it cometh not, and dig for it more than for hid treasures, which rejoice exceedingly and are glad when they can find the grave. He's talking about people that want to die. And you know in the tribulation, those men who are being tormented by those devilish locusts that come up out of the bottomless pit will wish they were dead, but they can't die. It says in Revelation 9, 6, And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it, and death and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. They'll want to die, but they can't. They'll search for death like hid treasure and would rejoice exceedingly if they could find the grave. Job three twenty three. Why is light given to a man whose way is hid and whom God hath hedged in? you got to imagine how that future time of tribulation will be. They're going to be basically hedged in. They're going to be under surveillance everywhere they turn. Their own family and friends will betray them. The government will be against them. And you can't buy or sell without the mark and worshiping the beast. You're going to be hedged in. It's going to take a supernatural protection just to keep them from killing you. Job 3.24 For my sighing cometh before I eat, and my roarings are poured out like the waters. Sighing, you know, like he's sighing like in mourning it's going to come every time before someone eats in the tribulation that's a saint because they won't be able to get their food so easily like they used to no more going into the store and buying whatever they want unless they take the mark and worship the beast job three twenty five. for the thing which i greatly feared has come upon me and that which i was afraid of is come unto me those horror movies they greatly feared they're going to come to them those nightmares they had are going to come become reality. I mean, in a sense, I think everybody in them knows something is coming. Something scary is coming. It's going to come for sure. Job 3.26, I was not in safety, neither had I rest, neither was I quiet, yet trouble came. Trouble came. Trouble. Search time of trouble through the Bible and notice the tribulation tones that it gives off. But this has been a man in the land of us and Job, Job's request for a rendezvous with death.